In this lesson, we explore the two sets of security architecture design principles described in Domain 3 of the CISSP Common Body of Knowledge. The purpose of designing a security architecture is to ensure security requirements are properly implemented in systems. Further, the architecture helps prevent or respond to attempts to compromise confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Organizations must build security into design, implementation, and management of new and existing systems. This enables safe operation that reasonably and appropriately manages risk associated with affected system and data classification and categorization. Security architecture design can apply to both systems and the network infrastructure. Security architecture design is based on one or more risk assessments. It's important that the security architect understand the risk associated with the data and critical systems involved. During the architecture design, the architect might encounter design elements that mitigate risk but are costly. This might result in going back to management and the risk assessment team to reassess the acceptability of certain risks. It's important to remember that architecture design must also include all statutory and regulatory compliance requirements. Sometimes architecture design goes off the rails. The architect and other stakeholders might want to include a control or design just because it's the latest and greatest technology. Architecture design must stay on track and not let excitement over new tech override what is reasonable and appropriate based on the business's operational environment. According to the official ISC Squared Guide to the CISSP Common Body of Knowledge Reference, success in security architecture is much more likely when one is aligned with the business and taking a risk management approach to security architecture. Before starting network design, it's important to select a set of design principles. Two popular principles are the protection of information in computer systems and the ISO IEC Technical Standard 19249. Building security into a system instead of adding it later is less expensive. It also enables security between system components. Security isn't just about keeping people honest. It's also about controlling what internal and external non-human entities can access. Before we begin looking at the elements of a design framework, it's important to understand the two overriding principles frameworks detail. First, security functions must be implemented in a way that prevents bypass, circumvention, or tampering. Second, security functions must be initiated whenever necessary to enforce one or more security requirements. Now we begin our look at the two sets of design principles. First, we explored the design principles as defined by Salzer and Schroeder, or the protection of information in computer systems principles. Salzer and Schroeder described 10 principles, economy of mechanism, fail-safe defaults, complete mediation, open design, separation of privilege, least privilege, least common mechanism, psychological acceptability, work factor, and compromise recording. Let's briefly look at each. As all security pros, and I know for certain, complexity is the enemy of security. The more complex our security controls and functions, the harder it is to manage them and to accurately determine risk. Security functionality should be divided into small, easy to manage components. This enables effective testing before and after system implementation. Fail-safe defaults goes hand-in-hand hand with today's adaptive authentication and zero trust. If an entity is not given specific permissions to access a resource or perform an action, access and the action should be denied. An example is blocking all firewall traffic, both ingress and egress, and explicitly allowing needed traffic. Further, when a control protecting highly categorized data and systems fails, it should fail close. In other words, 
If a control is unable to apply security policies to traffic, traffic should be blocked. Complete remediation is a factor of today's continuous authentication and zero trust. In zero trust, a subject, someone or something attempting to gain access, must re-authenticate when moving from a trust zone to another higher trust zone. Authentication should also take place between applications and services with each access. This graphic shows a high-level view of a system's attack surface. The architecture design must address authentication and authorization at each layer. This graphic from NIST SB 800-207 shows the possible conditions for authentication and authorization between implicit trust zones or ITZs. Once a system is accessed, use of any process must also be authenticated. This includes one process accessing other processes or services. The next principle is open design. Never rely on security through obscurity. In other words, hiding methods or data does not secure your resources. For example, we don't hide what encryption method we use. Instead, we keep the key secret. For our infrastructure, we design proper segmentation and traffic control. We don't try to hide connected resources and hope attackers don't find them. Commonly known as separation or segregation of duties, separation of privilege requires at least two actors or components to perform a security-sensitive operation. This helps prevent fraud and mistakes. Separation also applies to managing change to systems, controls, and infrastructure. Least privilege is a common access control. It ensures that a human or non-human actor can only perform those actions on an information resource that are absolutely needed to perform daily business tasks. Least common mechanism limits scopes of trust. The more we share components between users, the higher the risk something bad will happen. A big control is preventing transitive trust. If A trusts B, and B trusts C, then A should trust C is not zero trust. A and C must also explicitly trust each other. Psychological acceptability is about whether users will accept security limitations. Controls must not be so onerous that users ignore them or try to bypass them. Training helps users understand the importance of managing risk but architecture design should limit the impact on user workflow. As far as possible, controls should be hidden from users. Most attackers are looking for a return on investment. The investment is the effort expended to compromise all controls leading to their target. If the effort exceeds the gains, the attackers are likely to go elsewhere. Consequently, attention to the work factor principle helps make the job of an attacker too hard to bother with. The final Salter and Schroeder principle is compromise recording. No security architecture is perfect. We must assume that a threat actor will eventually compromise or bypass at least one of our controls. This requires detection controls and a strong practice incident response plan. Next is the ISO standard set of design principles. The ISO standard does not replace the previous principles. It augments them. 19249 is divided into two sets, architectural principles and design principles. There are five architectural principles, domain separation, layering, encapsulation, redundancy, and virtualization. The domain concept describes separating groups of components as common entities. The entities can be human or non-human, and each domain has its own trust level. Do not confuse domain with the Active Directory object. Although we can separate resources by AD domain, we also separate resources and users using network segmentation and segmentation access controls. Layering provides an infrastructure that contains multiple security layers. In this example, 
a user is attempting to access an application. Once on the application, the application must access the database. At each layer, the entity attempting access must authenticate. In addition, the system elements are separated by network segments. At each segment border, the traffic is checked to determine if it is allowed. Encapsulation requires that each function that operates on a resource or other object must be abstracted from the object. This enables applying security policies for each function to object access. The policies can use dynamic attributes to determine if access is allowed and what can be done with the object. Access can be controlled by who or what initiated the request and other attributes associated with adaptive or role-based access control. Redundancy is about eliminating single points of failure. When a single point of failure stops working or is compromised, business processes fail or security is compromised. Security architecture should include redundant components. Further, there should be multiple security controls between a threat actor and its target. Virtualization is the emulation of one device on a different device. For example, a virtual server might run on another server configured for virtualization. Virtualization results in the most cost-effective use of resources. The ISO design principles are least privilege, attack surface minimization, centralized parameter validation, centralized general security services, and preparing for errors and exceptions. Least privilege, again, is a common security control. It's recommended in any conversation about securing information assets. Simply, least privilege minimizes opportunities for damaging assets or revealing data, either accidentally or intentionally. It's closely related to integrity. Least privilege only allows an entity to perform actions on a resource that are absolutely needed to perform role-related business tasks. This applies to users, applications, and network services. A system's attack surface includes any interfaces or services that enable interaction with other systems or with users. We minimize the attack surface by disabling any unused services and closing all unneeded ports. We also ensure that anything that interfaces with the system must authenticate. Finally, applications must be securely designed and developed. This all together is known as system hardening. Parameter validation is all about input validation. Attackers use malicious input strings to steal or change database content. Under no circumstances should freeform input be allowed. The OWASP provides guidelines for input parameterization. The Centralized General Security Services principle guides us to centralized management and review of critical security activities. These include authentication, authorization, logging, and key management. Point-in-time efforts are not enough for critical systems and information. Today's adaptive and continuous authentication solutions are more effective. Systems and associated controls do not always behave as we expect. This is the role of preparing for errors and exceptions principle. Errors occur and traffic may behave well outside established baselines. When these things happen, we must be able to detect them and quickly respond. Also, failures or exceptions should result in blocking access to affected systems and data until response resolves the issues. This is, again, part of any incident response plan. Well, that's enough for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And until next time, be careful what you click.